welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. And I'm John, The Dental Guy, and uh, it is good to be back with you, Wes. Uh, it, uh, man, it's been a wild few weeks in our neck of the woods. We're going to be talking about that a uh, little bit today because it's it's been crazy, but here we are getting mm. to get back to do what we love. And uh, sometimes, you know, crazy things happen which make you extra thankful yep. for what you have, you know? And I think that's been kind of the name of the game this last few weeks. And I'm just glad to be back doing something that is, you know, f it is part of our lives, but it's fun, but it's like you could survive without it. You yes. know what I mean? And, and sometimes you need that perspective. We've talked about that on the show over the years, you know, sometimes when it's, going to do, for instance, like mission work, uh, doing dentistry for people in need or just giving away your services. And mm -hmm. you start to realize how, how much people really need out there. Or then when things, when crazy things happen, disasters happen, you just kind of have to step back and go, all right, there's a, uh, we're, we're in a pretty good, we're, gonna, we're in a pretty good situation, uh, compared to, compared to some, and we need to be, need to be thankful. Perspective, right? I mean, it definitely yeah. brings thing in, things into perspective when the power's out, the water's out for the unforeseeable future, and um, things that were once there aren't. Um, and mm. so, mm -hmm. um, if you're listening to this, um, John and I are, have been uh, directly and indirectly impacted uh, by uh, Hurricane Helene. Um, our personal property um, has not you know, we've not had any problems there. John had to shut down, I believe, for a little over a week. And and uh, there are, there's some other inconveniences that really aren't any in, inconvenience compared to what others have suffered, which is a total loss of their homes, some lost loved ones, family. And those are things that uh, it's just, you know, almost impossible to, if not impossible to recover from. And so our heart... But it's kind of a, but it's, it's kind of a post... COVID feeling is the best way I can mm. describe mm. the last That's couple interesting. of weeks. You put it that way. Mm. Because it's a feeling of uncertainty, a feeling of, I mean, to give you all perspective who are listening to this, in my county, in Tennessee, Eastern Tennessee, since the hurricane, two weeks post, we are still having to boil our water. We had no water for over a week and a half. I mean, zero water for a week and now we could get water right they're distributing bottled mm -hmm. water and you could you could get water but you know i mean to, to not have water to, to flush a toilet to not have water to take a shower uh i mean and, and now we're still boiling our water for the, the kids are going back to school and at the school they're going to have to hand out bottled water to the kids they can't wash their well they you know they can wash their hands carefully but you can't trust the water at the school and but yet over in Asheville, North Carolina, just over the mountain from me, it's so bad over there. The schools are looking at being without water for months, months. And so they're drilling wells. Imagine this, imagine this, if you're sitting there, you know, just enjoying life wherever you are. And, and, you know, imagine that you, your school that your kid goes to is, you know, you just come off a of fall break or whatever, and they, they say, well, guys, we don't, we're not gonna have water available for months. So in order for us to open the school back, we're gonna drill a well and hope we hit water. And then if we do, we will we'll come up with infrastructure to pump that water into the school so that we can reopen. We've already had kids in Asheville, North Carolina, leaving and re-enrolling in different school systems in other counties, other states, because their schools can't reopen. Now that's just the schools. I'm just trying to give you perspective. Okay. I mean, this is, and then there's a financial impact, which Wes and I were talking about before the show and you know, nobody in our area had flood insurance. And if you're a dentist listening to this and you know, like, like some people I talked to just the other day, you've got, you know, half a million dollars in, in debt, student loans, you own a building or a business or a practice that gets decimated by this and you have no money coming back to yeah. you to help you know, rebuild, what do you do? And that's what people are facing with their homes, with their businesses. And and yet, and then even just the day to day, I mean, just to, you know, we've been to countries where you couldn't drink the water, but never, never at my own house have I, have I had to think, oh, don't, don't put 
that water on the toothbrush. Yeah. You got to watch out. You know, you got to watch out. It's I crazy. The, but the, the, <clears throat> the idea of permanence gets challenged, but you don't really think about it permanence um, mm -hmm. until things that you thought were permanent are gone. And, um, yep. and there's a it, sense of anxiety that kind of mm -hmm. is there. And it reminds me of COVID when we were at this time where we mm. were all just feeling a sense of dread. You know, what will happen next? Will they get the water back on? Mm -hmm. Will they find a vaccine? Will we be able to go on with life? What is going to be next? Mm -hmm. You know, and obviously, again, very different than COVID. You know, we're not stuck in our homes where we can't see our friends or family, but there are some people that could not even literally drive out of their home. They couldn't walk out of their home. They couldn't get over the bridge because it had collapsed. Mm -hmm. This is in my county. I mean, it's just the craziest stuff. And so I, I, all I would say, you know, is first of all, a whole different show, but get your affairs in order. Yeah. You know, make sure that you have a plan. If things happen to you and your family or your business that could affect you, have a plan, have good advisors, have people that can tell you, here's some things that you can do if something happens because you're not bulletproof and your business is not, you know, there's no way you can avoid everything. So you've got to have a plan. Yeah, I think that's the thing is, you know, if you're listening to this and you're an owner and even if you're not, but I, I want to speak to owners just for a minute here. If you don't have contingency plans for, just if you don't show up tomorrow, you're gone. Or mm -hmm. or an act of God happens, like a hurricane, and basically, I was telling John, is like as if someone just took their arm and just wiped away your property completely. You show up tomorrow, it's not there. And you're like, that'll never happen, okay? Mm. That's what a lot of people are saying, because one in a thousand years could be tomorrow. And you're thinking, mm -hmm. well, I'm just not a, you know, that kind of a guy that or a girl that thinks like that. Yeah, I mean, I'm not either. So that's why I have advisors that told me that you need to think like that. <clears throat> so you all know, recently, um, I built a building two years ago, completed it. And one of the things that we did, and we were re reviewing our policies last year, we were looking at some other things and just updating those. And we made sure that if any, and I'm not even close to a flood zone where I'm at. So we made sure no matter what, we have contingency plans in place that allow us to carry on if the mm -hmm. worst could happen. And, and even right down to, even if I just don't show up, like there's a document that a few people have in my family and my manager has and my wife has, and some of my closest advisors have, that if something happens to me, all you have to do is open this document, and you just follow steps. Step one, do this. Step two, do this. And you're thinking, like, really? You're well that well planned? No, I'm that well advised. Because innately, I'm more of a spontaneous guy, you know, I like to just go and do without sometimes thinking about it. John would call me a cowboy, you know? <laughs> <laughs> In some ways. In some ways. I mean. But you have to have these plans because then it allows you to take risks. And it doesn't mean we're trying to take risks in general, but in business, yeah. you know, if you have a backstop, if you have guardrails that will protect you in the event of something crazy happening, then it allows you to, to not worry and there's things that the thing that we're talking about, though, is yeah, I know every business owner has things you worry about, but we're talking about are do you even know what you should be worrying about? You know, John because is, that's the problem. There's a lot of blind spots as to what should you be worrying about? You know, should you have cyber insurance yes. against malware? And, you know, uh, that that's a real thing. It happens to people. And yet a lot of people do not have any coverage for you know, somebody actually locking up your server to where you have to pay to be ransom, uh, to get your data back. Yeah. Ransomware. And, and do you have payment against, or do you have insurance that covers you in the event of 
a, a, a hurricane that allows for your employees to get paid, you to get paid, uh, you know, just all of these things. We all know about car insurance, and we all understand, I think, if there's a fire, but there's a lot of stuff out there, and I think that's what sometimes these disasters sort of teach us as, as business people or just as homeowners, whatever it is, that, man, go back and review what you got. And, you know, I mean, even just to the extent of, do you have a, do you have a will? Do you have a do you have a trust for any money that you might have? How's it going to pass to your kids? Do you have a you have a have you ever talked to somebody about what happens if you're not here tomorrow? I think that and the, those the are things that are a big deal. The complexity of some of these conversations require specialists um, mm -hmm. in 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 certain industries, and and I and I really I don't mind for young dentists to you know, that don't really own anything yet to utilize family and friends for certain bits of advice. But I'll just tell you right now, when this kind of stuff happens and family and friends are the people that you bought your policies after, and then it turns out they don't, aren't covering what you really thought they were covering. I mean, that's where it really starts to get a little hard. So my advice to you, you know, that are listening is regardless of who you have, it's important to ask the right questions. And it's important to put yourself around people that are really know what questions to ask you. Because if you're not annually or biannually reviewing some of these things, um, because it is a changing landscape when it comes to things like uh, cyber insurance and things that you really didn't have to have, you know, even a few years ago, um, there's 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 policies that aren't that expensive that allow right. us to operate beyond these disasters and function in a stress fee environment. Sure, there will be some stress, but I'll tell you right now, I'll lay my head down tonight knowing if I not here in the morning or if my business is gone tomorrow that Things are going to be okay. It's going to be hard, mm -hmm. but things are going to be okay. And you might think, well, I haven't got to that point yet. You don't even have to get to a point. You just yep. have to know what policies and no, and you don't even have to know. You have to put yourself around people even like we've had on our show before. And so, look, hey, listen, if you're listening to this, text the dental guys, 865-544-8954. Um, if you've got questions for the dental guys, if you've got comments – Send them via text, and maybe we'll share them on the show. We, I like to share them as long as you leave at least a name. It doesn't have to be your full name, um, but name and town. Name and town if you went, wish to give you an opinion, comment, or even just a, um, a question for John and I. So we appreciate you guys listening and responding. The response via text has been amazing. I was responding to some good texts the other day, and they were great. Um, tonight's show, John, is brought to you by. Yes. Sort of, yeah. Tonight. Well, I was going to say tonight's show. Yeah, bring it, man. Because yeah. this is this is where we got to give the props. Yeah. So, hey, restorative driven implants. If you're uh, interested in getting involved with surgical placement of dental implants, look no further than restorative driven implants. Recently, um, I was just finishing up teaching a um, a section of the course. It was fantastic. Some of the things that we teach at Restorative Driven Implants is the restorative driven approach. And you would be surprised about how much things have changed even today in what we're looking at from a standpoint of the crown down. How does that guide the surgery? And with a modern approach, Restorative Driven Implants gives you the opportunity to one, place implants on live patients in the United States. That just doesn't happen everywhere. We love to keep the, the class size and the student-teacher ratio to very small numbers, so two-to-one ratio in surgery. And that, that really makes it to where it's, it's individualized. We can really refine and, and help you guys be successful in leaving and doing real-world cases, um, single units, side-by-side -side implants, a couple here, a couple there, quadrant-based dentistry implant therapy, even into starting to look at some of the more of the advanced cases in the anterior when and 
when should you place an anterior implant? We're going to talk a little bit about that tonight um, in our communication strategy. Uh, but head over to RestorativeDrivenImplants.com. We appreciate the sponsorship. Or call 715-207-6587 today. John? And the show is also brought to you by the Dental Crafters Network, longtime sponsor of the Dental Guys. Discover the difference a relationship with the Dental Crafters Network can make. As a full-service laboratory, they pride themselves on listening and understanding your unique needs, guiding you toward innovative solutions that make a difference. Dental Crafters Network focuses on improving your patient's quality of life with cutting-edge digital dentistry solutions. Visit dentalcrafters.net or call 1-800-472-8302 and mention the Dental Guys to receive 10% off your first case. Thanks once again to the Dental Crafters Network for being a longtime sponsor of the Dental Guys. And trust me, you will not be disappointed if you give them a try. Wes, I want to talk about talking. <laughs> That's what I want to talk about. I want to talk about talking because... A lot of what we have spoken about in the last few years has been about techniques. Mm -hmm. It's been about data. It's been about products, research, all of which are amazing. Mm. Uh, it's, it's even been about sort of treatment planning and how to go about developing treatment plans. We've even tried to dive some into that. For this show, I really think we, because we get a lot of these questions, okay, people start to go, all right, let's say I've gone and I've taken all the courses, or I'm a, I feel like I'm a real expert in this area of dentistry, but I keep hearing people ask the question of how do you actually communicate some of these things to the patient to get buy-in from the patient in the things that you're trying to do. And we, we might not get to all of this tonight, but there's a couple of things that Wes and I want to, we've just been talking over the years and we've kind of both developed. And I think because we've been to a lot of the same courses, we, we share a lot of the same ways of talking about things. But I think where I want to start, Wes, is so many people when they when they talk to us sometimes when we show some cases to people as we're teaching or we are you know saying hey here's what I'm here's what I'm interested in here's what's messing with me and we show this case that we did and <clears throat> you know it's maybe this really neat case that goes through a lot of interdisciplinary treatment planning interdisciplinary treatment a lot of communication sometimes a big financial investment sometimes not, sometimes just something that involved a lot of thought process. Mm -hmm. And at the end of these cases, sometimes you'll hear people say, you know, I just don't have those patients in my practice. And when I hear that from people, I think I kind of smile every time because mm -hmm. I just, I think you don't know me well enough to know where I practice because I practice in small town, rural eastern tennessee and i promise you these patients are in my practice they're in everyone's practice but when we go to dental school dental school is a great springboard it's a great jumping off point a good dental school education really in the end does a decent job of setting you up to start to understand how to treat a tooth you see a tooth in front of you you get an x-ray of that tooth, you do an exam of that tooth, you do the probings, you do the percussion, you go through all of your testing, you look at crown to root ratio, you look at bone loss, you look at all these things and you make a call, first of all, on the diagnosis, second of all, on the treatment, and then dental school prepares you usually well enough to know if this is something you can do or not and how to accomplish the restoration or extraction of that particular tooth. And I think when we get out of dental school, we feel pretty good about doing a composite on that tooth or doing a crown prep on that tooth or extracting that tooth. 
And maybe some dental schools prepare you for some of the more advanced things, but single tooth dentistry is extremely important. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to diminish that by trying to make it sound as if Wes and I are not a huge fan of excellent single tooth dentistry. I think if you can do an excellent crown prep, an excellent quadrant of composite, an excellent root canal, if you can, if you can develop a single tooth treatment plan or say a quadrant dentistry treatment plan, we salute you. You have done an excellent thing if you can pull it off but so many patients come into your practice when you have come out of dental school and you sort of don't know how to manage the full mouth and i'm not talking about treating all the teeth in the mouth i'm not talking about full mouth reconstructions or hybrids with zirconia or any of that i'm talking about do you know how to communicate to a patient who has only ever had single tooth dentistry. In other words, patient comes in because they have a broken tooth. It has a MOD amalgam. The mesial buccal cusp on number 30 has fractured. MOD amalgam, mesial buccal cusp is fractured on 30. It's fractured above the tissue level. Pretty favorable, no endodontic involvement. PA looks pretty normal. You got good tooth structure. So, okay, does this tooth need a crown? Sounds maybe like it like it could. Or it needs some type of full coverage or partial coverage or something along those lines, right? But how do you change your discussion from a practice that becomes more and more full of patients who only come in when it breaks? And you do the crown, but then next month they break something else. And they come in and they kind of litter your schedule with limited emergency exams. I broke something else, doc. And you go, okay, I can fix that. And maybe you do. Maybe you do a great job. But then how do you, because I hear this all the time. People are like, well, you know, I'm just, I'm running like crazy. I've got all these people coming to the emergencies. I'm just kind of like putting out fires and that's a lot of my practice. That's, that's kind of the area that I'm in, I'll hear people say. So the question is, why is it that Wes and I are doing more cases that are more comprehensive in nature? And how is it that we can start to get a single tooth dentistry patient to think differently? to start to change their mindset. So Wes, with that little intro, right, let's take that patient that comes into your practice on Monday at 10 a.m. in your limited eval slot that you've blocked for these types of people, because I know you and I block places for, you know, the, the emergency or the toothache or what have you, because that's one way patients can come into our practice. So this patient comes in with this cusp fracture and, and they, you may take a look in there. Well, first of all, just walk us through what are you looking at? And then what does that discussion look like if you start to see some things? And how do you, how do you change the discussion and how do you mold the discussion to maybe try to change the patient into a more comprehensive thinking patient? <clears throat> We're going to assume in this conversation that you've had training to become to be aware of how to diagnose some of these things that we're talking about. So you've had all the training to be able to to be able to understand that when you look at something, you say, "Whoa, whoa, wait a minute! This is beyond just single tooth dentistry." So I I think that the the very first thing that whenever Regardless of what I say, if an emergency is on in my chair and it happens so often that my assistant has already went in and made an assessment and there are things that the team knows the type of dentistry that I'm going to give. So 
But it's my job as the doctor to go in and actually create awareness for these issues. Now, we're not talking about hygiene here at this point, okay? So the very first thing that I would say that has been the biggest influence on people is being a very likable, believable person. And I, and I think that goes overlooked. Um, a lot of dentists that want to do more, um, they, I, w- I walk in the room, and the very first thing that I would say, let's say Joe's sitting in the chair, and, and I, I walk in and I say, hey, Joe, how's it going? Or I was like, it's terrible that this happened to you today, but I mean, I just want to say hi and how's how was your weekend or you know, how's the family? Where are you from? Where like, are you, tell me if, what you do. If it's it's a personal conversation, like and I always try to find something good to talk about. Mm. Um, I always try to turn the conversation to something good first, whether it's about if it's a lady. Uh, sometimes it's it's appropriate to comment like, man, you look very nice today. Thank you so much for coming and seeing us. And you might think, well, that sounds so scripted. It doesn't have to be. But you have to be personable. You have to come around the chair and you have to sit down and you have to actually face the person. So many of us have trouble facing people. And because we're fearful of what they might say about us, we already know that they don't like us. They don't want to be here. This is when people are at their worst in the dental chair. These are stressful situations. Mm -hmm. They don't want you to drill and give them shots. We know that. They know that. That doesn't even need to come up. But being a very genuine, likable, having a conversation that is about maybe what happened this weekend with a local sports team or if you knew a little piece of information about where they were from and strike hey i know joe that lived up there he lived beside the the there's a great little store up the road from that and even if there's a little bit of an embellishment about it it's a story that you can build upon Mm -hmm. and so that's the first part of my breaking down that hey i'm a normal guy and you're a person to me type of a conversation. Mm. And there's so much psychology in this. We're not going to get into that, but I, I implore you, please, please. This is one of the first steps in becoming a, a dentist that's able to take patients that you may not ever thought you were possible of doing something greater than just single tooth dentistry and just patching and fixing and patching and fixing to someone that actually says, you know what, I want him to fix this and we're going to do this. And so then, yeah, I, there's I go, a trust. There's a trust factor, right? That's you're that's right. starting to build early by not just being coming clinical. in the room and saying, "Let's take a look at the tooth." You because know, that's you're what starting most people to make, do, John. That's right. There's you have to, no matter how busy you are that day. Yep. You have to make that patient feel like you have all the time in the world for them. And the truth is, is that many times we don't really feel that way down deep because we know that we've got three or four other things going on um, in our practice, let alone our life. Yep. But you have to make that patient feel. If this is the kind of dentistry you want to do, you have to make the <laughs> patient mean- feel as if you are not just coming in there to have them give you their credit card. You know, exactly. it's got to be... It's got to be more. It's got to be, tell me how you're feeling. Tell me what you're about. What, what's your family about? What are your kids about? What do you do? Where are you from? You know, those things that you would ask anyone that you would get to know. Because if you forget that part and the patient who may already be nervous, for instance, they don't have any difference. You are just the McDonald's of dentistry. You are a commodity. You are like every other person that they view dentists to be. They think all dentistry is the same. Yes. They think a a Big Mac's a Big Mac's a Big Mac, a crown's a crown's a crown. And you have to start breaking through that. Oh, well, you know what? This person asked me about my family 
they ask me about my life. No one's ever done that before. That that's the beginning. That's the tip of the iceberg of what you're about to ask them. That's, that's right. the tip of the iceberg of what hopefully the relationship will be in mm -hmm. terms of the clinical. But it starts with why are you here? What do you want? Who are you? Yeah, you know, the thing you know, that happens there is there's a certain amount of time that's spent always, whether it's in hygiene or whether it's in a new patient exam, um, whether it's in an emergency, whether it's an emergency of a patient of record, that, or whether it's just the crown that's on the schedule for today, like a single tooth dentistry type of a patient. There's always a certain amount of time given to how are you doing how are things, you know, and a little, and if, if your schedule is ran in a way that doesn't allow you to have this opportunity to create relationships, then you're, you're just not going to create opportunities to be able to make and convert some of these cases into something that it could be a greater way to help patients achieve complete health. And so what happens in the operatory at this point is the assistant typically is across from me. I'm sitting in the chair and we're, we have a very intentional body language that is focused on the person that's here. And she's just in the patient's, she can see the patient. I can see the patient. I'm usually sitting a little lower than the patient is because I want, I'm, I'm a tall guy. I want to sit down and have a conversation and, and, and then I flip the conversation. It's like, well, I'm glad you're here today, even though it's on bad terms. I'm glad we've got to meet. And Kylie told me. Can, can I stop you there for just a second? Yeah. Because I like what you're saying. <laughs> We're not going to make it this, through our topics. This is why this podcast this show. is, this is going to be a long but one. I don't, I don't think the listeners fully understand the importance of what you just said. Now, I'm going I'm to say, now, now, if you're listening to this, you've, you've obviously, you, you probably listened to us Hopefully this isn't your first show, okay? Because you're going to think we're like very touchy-feely. Mm. I promise you we talk about like, you know, statistics a lot. But Well, the last episode like, we geeked out over bonding, so that was enough, right? Right. I think hopefully this is a balance. But let us let me talk about how our why our cameras are positioned the way they are <laughs> for the podcast. If you're watching the YouTube version, if you're on, as, I, as we always say, stop your mower, you know, st pull over. Pull up YouTube. No, but seriously, we are we have our cameras positioned above us, looking John, you're down. Telling our secrets. Oh no, it's a secret. <laughs> and why? Because we learned years ago from people smarter than us mm. that when you want to have a conversation with someone, especially someone you don't know, especially for the first time, and you sort of have a position of authority to them, maybe in their mm. mind that if you are above them looking down it's intimidating it's mm. less inviting but if you are sort of looking up at them and they feel like they have a position of authority or sort of like power over you it's less intimidating so that's why we have our cameras how we are and but it's also why when we come in the room we don't stand up and talk down to people especially women as a man mm. i do not and will not if i'm in the hygiene operatory and that woman is down there and i'm about to tell her some news she's gonna go leaned up i'm gonna sit down and i'm gonna position myself lower than the patient because the last thing i want to do is to talk down to someone who's in a very vulnerable position in the chair who already is nervous so these new patients who come in, when we meet them, just the way that we sit, just the way that our eyes meet their eyes, I, I you will watch it. And there's a couple of people that do a great CE on this. Yeah, Chris Ramsey mm. and his partner Ritter. Uh, years ago, I saw them do a whole two hours on body language in the dental chair mm -hmm. and talking about how you can read someone and how they're feeling about you when they walk in the room, how they sit in the chair. Do they cross their arms? Mm. They're, they're, they don't trust you. Social media. Do they have what they call the, mm. they, yeah, do they have the runner stance where mm. they're wanting to run out of the chair? Their, their legs are on either side of the chair. They want to get out of there. You know, are they are they engaged? Or are they lean back? Blah blah blah. But as providers, we can set a less aggressive, a more 
relaxed tone just by sitting below them, like Wes said, by you know leaning into the conversation, by not sitting back and crossing our arms. Mm. And the patient, you if you do this and you start also, uh, there's a there's some great books on this. Yeah, you know if you want to start to be uh, really understand. Uh, how this works like it's really a very interesting thing to start to read books about how this how this stuff works you know like what is it what is it that you can do uh to make people feel comfortable without saying anything mm -hmm. and it comes down to you know how your office how your operatory is set up but more importantly how you sit and how you speak to pay and here's the book i'll give you and this is one that has influenced me this last year okay on this it's called never split the difference never split the difference negotiating as if your life depended on it now when you read this book author chris voss he was the fbi's lead international kidnapping negotiator so you would think this is all about how to get what you want mm -hmm. and yeah there's some of it of like if you have something you want then yeah there's there's some tactics that you can use to try it but most of what it was as a hostage negotiator voss talks about how can we as humans how do we as humans trust another human when all we have is maybe the voice that we use the words that we use and he talks a lot about things like mimicking and repeating phrases and using the person's name and and just the way that you speak to them. And this was somebody who was trying to get a very specific outcome. But our point in this, and Wes just kind of triggered me on this, because just that one thing of how you come in, like if you're the doctor coming in and this patient's leaned back and you're talking to them, I'm telling you right now, your treatment acceptance oh, is not going to be great. It's impactful. It's huge. It's huge. It's, I never approach a room. If I ever do, man, our team knows. Our hygienists know. Our team knows not to ever enter a room, um, or I will, I will never enter a room where I greet somebody that's laying down. Um, it's not mm. appropriate. And it's not, I have, and you're like, ah, I just sit the patient in and back and back and up. And I'm like, I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. I don't greet people laying down. Yeah, we meet each other sitting up. We meet each other setting up. And I immediately, I have two chairs in my operatories. I have three, four. I'm down them now. I have four chairs <laughs> in my operatories. I have the doctor's stool. I have the patient chair. I have the assistant's stool. And I have a chair in the corner, and I have room for another chair for another person if they want it, if they had a, had another person to come with them. And those chairs are set far enough away next to the window, like you have the same thing, John, and yep. um, that I can even enter in, and I can set at that chair, and it's automatically, it's automatically in the perfect position. And I can change my posture to engaged, to slightly disengaged. Engaged posture is leaning forward slightly, not not hands on your not not necessarily elbows on your on your uh, thighs, but just a slightly mm -hmm. engaged posture. I'm interested in what you have to say. And and what you'll notice, what you'll notice, and it doesn't, it's not apparent immediately. What you'll notice is that more patients, the more you do these things, more patients will say this, no one has ever spent that amount of time with me and talked with me like that. I already mm -hmm. know that I'm in the right place and I, I, I can't believe this is, and, and if they say it, it's great. <coughs> Immediately, I hear it a lot. Oh, if I found the place, I found where I need mm -hmm. to go. I don't know how many times. I hear that. So, mm -hmm. you know, the conversation, you know, we'll move on from body language. And it's a great book. I've never read this book. I'm interested now because uh, that's pretty cool. But I've read a lot of books on 
you know, there's another book, How to Win Friends and Influence Others. That's a, oh, yeah. a great book. One of the that, best ever. You, maybe the best book. ever. Maybe one of the best ever on some of these things. But what I would say is that this conversation really starts with being a likable, believable person. Now, some of you guys that are listening to this are in dental school, and you've had your head in a book since you were 16 years old for the most part. And now you're probably in your early to mid-20s. You've never interacted with team members. You've never had conflicting conversations. You've never had tell somebody tell you no. Everything has been built around trying to, to get yes on a, on a test, to receive a, an acceptance, uh, to pass something, to receive you know uh, excellence, and to, to mm. get the grade. But this is not about getting the grade. This is not about getting the yes. This is about this is about influencing people to achieve health. And what you have to understand is you have to be prepared for no a million times. A million times. Mm-hmm. You have to be prepared when you walk in that operatory that nine times out of ten, it's a no. And that's okay. That does not mean they don't like you. You have to get it inside your mind that I'm going in and people don't like me. People don't Mm -hmm. like me. So how am I going to win them? Okay. And it starts with getting your head up, stop looking at the floor and looking people in the eye. And some people, listen, I, my associate, my, I've taught him this and he had taught it more is caught than is taught. Okay. That's a, that's a great, that's a great saying. I didn't say that, but Mm -hmm. more is caught than is taught. But my associate has watched me over the past year and a half. And one of the things that he said that I did, I didn't realize I was doing it, but I was, I was immediately greeting people in a way that made people feel comfortable. And that could be a handshake. It could be a, a, a a touch on somebody that I might know. And he said, it's incredible just because of the way that you've went into the room and created a sense of like, Hey, it's okay. I'm a normal person. You're normal Mm -hmm. to me. I'm normal to you. And I care about you more than I care about even the dentistry we're going to talk about here. I want to know what's going on in your life because that impacts what I'm getting ready to tell them. Because listen, if today their air conditioner went out and they had trouble getting here because their car broke down and then you go in and you try to sell them a full mouth rehab, dude, you're insensitive. Mm -hmm. All you care about is the next car payment. And so this is, the, this is why it's important. You have to know why people are in your chair and how they got there. Because if you don't know that and you don't spend time figuring that out and you use team members to help you with these things, because it doesn't rely 100% on you. In fact, it relies more on your team in some ways to set you up for success. That way, That's you right. Can, and I think that that's, that's how when the phone is answered yes. from the beginning before you know, we step foot in the room it's trying to create something that's different. Yes. And you know when the when the patient is is being sort of interviewed on the phone, hey, tell me about you know what's happening. What what brings mm-hmm. you to this phone call? Essentially. And allowing the patient to decide how they enter the practice, whether it's for a toothache, whether it's through hygiene, whether it's through a comprehensive exam, however you have that set up in your practice. Once a patient has told you what they're coming in for, it's being able to tell the patient what's unique about our office. You know, what is it about our office that's different? And you're, you, whoever's on the phone with that patient has that opportunity right then to say, well, hey, our office, just so you know, our office is different <laughs> than any other dental office you've ever been to before. Yeah. And so when you come in, you the exam is going to be probably a little bit more involved than what you're used to, but we're going to make sure that we know exactly what you need. And what our office always tells people on the phones, we're going to treat you like our family. Mm-hmm. Now you might hear that and think that sounds like just a thing we say. And so, and yes, if I was on the phone, I might be like, well, that's kind of weird, man. These people are weird. They just told me they're going to treat me like family. What is this? Some kind of like, you know, leave it to beaver episode. Like, what are we, are we in the fifties? What is this? (laughs) And so, but that's okay. I want to be weird a little bit. I want to be memorable. Right. And so that's the whole idea is being memorable 
that's part of the experience. There has to be something that sets up an expectation from the team that this is going to be different, that we're mm -hmm. not the same as everybody else, and we like it that way. Mm -hmm. And then when we come in the room, we've got to be able to back that up through the time that we take, through the things that we say. And although we don't have, again, hours and hours to talk through this on the show, I think that as we get into the conversation, right, so we've gotten to know this patient a little. We've established who they are, maybe where they're from, how they got here, what they're about. And then it's asking, obviously, about their chief complaint, because regardless of what you're going to talk about that day, in the end, that is what got the patient into your office. And so we can never forget that when a patient comes in with a problem that's specific to them, that that is the first thing we need to address. And that's different than when we do a comprehensive exam. When we do a comprehensive exam from the beginning with a patient who's come in knowing that they're going to get a comprehensive exam, that's a totally different conversation. We've talked about that on previous shows. But when someone comes in because one tooth is a problem, and they, exactly, they're not, they didn't ask for you to tell them everything. Mm -mm. They only have given you permission, really, in their mind, to address this one issue. And they're used to that. Say they've been to offices multiple times, or maybe they've been to your office, and that's been the way you've done things for years. That's the way I did things when I first started, because I didn't know yeah, any I, other way. I think the, the thing that's interesting, whenever I have the opportunity to create a transition into dentistry, the segue is, you know, I know you're frustrated because you're here today because of the, the tooth that broke. If you wouldn't mind, I'd like to take a look here. Kylie's already looked and she tells me that, you know, it's not painful or there is some pain associated with this. And I want to take care of, I want to take care of what I can today. I want to help you. Mm. And and if you just say that, I want to help you. Okay. And so um, I, I, I begin and say that you look in this patient's mouth and you just, you, you turn the mirror over as Dr. Bowers taught me at West Virginia University. You turn the mirror over and you look at the opposing and you look at the, you look across arch and you start to begin to see there's multiple situations here where this patient has broke multiple teeth and you start to look and you're like, you're trained in this. So you see this, this edge wear in the anterior and you see a reduced vertical dimension of occlusion. Teeth look short. Mm -hmm. You see a, even when you were talking with them, see, this is, this is how far it goes in my office. Now you're starting to look at like their face and how they speak, and you notice that they don't show mm. incisal edges. Like you can't even see the upper incisal edges when they smile at you because you made them laugh. You 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 can see gum tissue whenever they talk to you on the lowers, and the lowers look short and worn. See, I don't even really need to look in their mouth at this point, mm. but I do anyway because it's what dentists do. And so we look in their mouth, and you go like, okay, oh, man. Mm -hmm. And you say something like that. I like, I like, Ooh, I just looking around yeah. here a little bit and like, and then I, and then I take my gloves off and guess what? I sit right back down and I take my mask mm -hmm. off. Yep. I take my glasses and put them down around my neck. And I say, you know what? I can tell that you've been through a lot. You've, you've definitely spent some time in the dental office and, um, this tooth that you came in for, let's talk about that. You've probably already know what it needs. Yep, needs a crown, doesn't it? I mean, they'll tell you because they've been there before or what does it need, and you know? Well, mm -hmm. here's a picture of it, and here's what it yep. looks like, you know? Has anyone ever talked to you a little bit more about some other concerns? Yes. Yeah, like what could be causing this? Yeah. It looks like it's not your first crown. It's not your crown first Or your crown. first example of this, and have you ever had this happen with other teeth? And you yeah. may already know their history. You know, you may have been the one who did the other crowns, and that's okay. It's okay to say, "Yeah, I've been learning." I'm going to look at you here. like I've never seen you ever before in my life because there's been some things that I've been learning yeah. that have changed the way that I think about things because I'm starting to understand why things happen. Mm -hmm. But if you can see it and read the history in their mouth by just looking at what has been done, 
and you can you can get a feel. Hey, this is you know the other three first molars have had crowns. They they look like zirconia, so you know they're not thirty years old. You're like, okay, I can tell maybe this has <laughs> happened before in the last few years. Are these crowns relatively new? You've had, you know, it sounds like this mm -hmm. is a pattern, and I'm seeing a pattern, and I'm seeing some things that might explain it. And then it's a matter, I think, of I at least I think you do the same. Would you like to talk about that? Would mm -hmm. you like me to tell you a little I, bit more about that? I'm concerned asking, about this. Are you right. concerned about it? Like I yeah. see this. this I'm, I'm, you know, maybe I'm holding up the iPad we here. Need, yeah, we need permission from the patient to dive deeper. Because if the patient, if I say to this person, look, I, I kind of see a pattern here. I think this is probably something that's caused by some patterns that I see. And we're showing them the picture. We see we're building a case that there's a pattern. We're building a case that there's a reason. It's not just, oh, you broke another tooth. That happens because of wear and tear or age or whatever. We're saying, hey, there's something we could do about this. Are you interested in talking about that? Or would you like me to kind of go through what I think might be causing this? And you know what? Some people will say, you know what? Let's just, can we just fix it? And yeah. you know what? That is completely fine. <laughs> That's okay. I mean, that's what you're good at, right? You're good at single tooth we can, dentistry. We can, we can do uh, uh, most of the time. Now, now there'll be a whole other podcast Wes and I are going to do about implants mm -hmm. because there is a difference. And I think both he and I, we haven't even we've we've talked about this, but we have not calibrated on purpose because we try not to we try not to know what each other's going to say on these types of topics. But I know what Wes is going to say. There's a difference in traditional dentistry when it comes to crowns and fillings root canals whatever because you you can still go back and change things yeah now it might not be cheap but it's less permanent yeah implants implants are potentially permanent or very difficult mm -hmm. to go back and retreat so we might talk differently about implants but on teeth if we have gone through this, we have done everything we can to try to give the patient the opportunity to be educated. I, I, there are times where, you know, okay, patient is not ready. It doesn't mean we don't do the dentistry because they won't, they don't want well, or, to or have they a say, discussion. You know what, you know, um, I don't only want what insurance covers, you know, and I know that's what a lot of you hear. That's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's fine. You know, that's right. fine. We and, can and still get you to a healthier place by fixing this one problem you have. Yeah, no problem. And, and any time. And if listen, the time comes that you want to right. come back and discuss the big picture. But I think the thing that's important, and my associate and I talk about this all the time. In the end, one of the things that my, my, my ultimate goal is to get everybody to do comprehensive dentistry or think about it. Mm -hmm. Think about it. Okay, consider it know what's possible that's what our ultimate goal is but actually i have i have a very selfish second goal okay my first goal is for the patient to have health it's not selfish it's for them to get healthy mm -hmm. my second goal is for them not to not to blame it on me yes when another problem happens I want it to be a different discussion next time. I want it to be a different discussion. I want them to come in with another tooth broken, and instead of them saying, I broke another tooth, oh my gosh, I don't know what's happening, I want them to say, well, you told me. I guess you're, I guess you're happy now, or whether it's, a, whether it's sort of a jab at me right. in a funny kind of way, or whether it's a, you know, Maybe we should talk about this whole thing you were talking about, whatever it is you think's going on. Or maybe it's like, hey, I'm ready to I'm ready to do a little bit more because I don't want to lose my teeth. Maybe, maybe they're ready. They're like, you know, I don't want to keep having to do this every year. I've got I want it to be a different that, discussion. I've got patients that have said, you know, right now, all I can do until I get to this point is just kind of patch and fix. But I really want to get there. And I know what you told me. And I maybe have mentioned it once. And mm -hmm. a lot of times I think that <clears throat> people need to be offered a choice. 
because mm. that life is full of choices. And so if it's just this, hey, the next time you see him in the office and the hygienist sees them and they're like, hey, I know is I want to give you an option today. I know a year or so ago because you came in and they came in and they tell you, hey, I've chipped another tooth. I know a year or so ago that Dr. Mullins talked to you a little bit about why you were breaking teeth. Is this a good time to talk about this today a little further or would you like to just go ahead and get your teeth cleaned? Mm-hmm. You know, and so what it does is it creates an opportunity for one, for you not to come in the room and have to browbeat them Two, the hygienist becomes an advocate for the type of dentistry that you're doing to help people. And number three, it gives people an opportunity to choose. And That's the, right. cho- the choice is okay. And listen, you're, You've got to understand something is that the most unlocking thing is what John just said. The moment that I realized that anterior composites and anterior veneers were so successful in the right situations, meaning like occlusion is right and teeth are in the Mm -hmm. right place, it unlocked treatment plans for people that I never thought were possible. And the idea that the young woman that was 16 that chipped her front tooth because, um, you know, she was playing volleyball and just bumped the ground and she never had the opportunity to have orthodontic care, but her dentist had to repair it because she's getting ready to go to the prom, you know, at 16. And here you are at 25 and she's chipped it again and again and again. The greatest thing you can ever do for a patient is to create awareness for their problems and why things they are and take the pressure off your failures. That's right. And if somebody says, you know, I think we should just try that filling again. Mm -hmm. After you have said, listen, there is a better way. There is a reason. There is something we could do that would last longer. I'd love to go through that with you. But in the end, as long as it's do no harm... That's right. right, which is our primary thing. There is, it's not like we can't do it, but the conversation gets different. I'm telling you. Now, sometimes it gets awkward. It does. Sometimes when you have seen this problem time and time and time again, you have an obligation, in my opinion, Wes's opinion, I know he agrees on this, that you have to say the same thing every time. If you want to do this kind of dentistry or Even more importantly, again, selfishly, if you want to have more patients in your practice who do have a value for this and less patients in your practice who don't care because the person who you've had the conversation with three or four times who doesn't care, I will tell you right now, if you're younger in your practice, even if you've been doing this a while, the quicker you can figure those people out and make it real uncomfortable for them because you know there's a better way and they just aren't in line with your way of doing dentistry. (laughs) If the way you're doing dentistry for them is not how you would do it for your family member or for your team member, and it's repeatedly that way and they won't hear anything you say, it might not be... I mean, you have to make the decision sometimes, who do you want to be as a dentist? Is this person the right fit for you in your practice? Because I can almost guarantee you they're the same way about hygiene. They're making them crazy too. They don't want to listen to anything they say either. They don't want to pay their bills sometimes either. And that's just a different kind of patient. And you can create your own hell by choosing to just know that that per- oh that person on the schedule again they never want to do anything the pit in your you know? stomach well, patient you know yeah uh, you might need to set some people free let them be, let them go free and and that's okay and that's okay. and listen this is the long game the long game is building a practice where people want and value what you're you're offering and so if you're offering complete care all the time, all the time, 
constantly. I mean, I offered it today like three times, you know, mm-hmm. and I was only there for th- four hours, you know, at clinically. My associate, now he's a year and a half in, he's offering it every mm-hmm. single new patient exam. Yep. And I hear a lot of patients saying, well, I just really can't do that right now, but can you just do this? And he says, no problem with that. This is yep. this and this is that. And and so conflict is something, conflict avoidance is something that most people, like that's what they, they do. People avoid conflict. They don't want to have a tough conversation. And these are very difficult conversations to have. And, it's, and it can be taxing for certain personality types. And it does take a lot of work. And we, I've got a couple of hygienists in my office that, um, are not built for conflict. And we've really spent a lot of time working with our team members that struggle with these things. And mm. we've drew the line when they have done the things that they've been done, how to know how to do and have the conversation to a certain point and to, to back them up. And so they come and get the people that are better at conflict, which both myself and Dr. Anthony are pretty good at conflict conversations and how we handle things. Patients are going to try to tell you what to do, right? Mm. So the customer is always right is an old adage that my grandmother that owned a flower shop used to say. And I don't know that it's wrong in the right context, But in the context that I'm speaking of here is that people want to drive their care in your office Mm. because of what most dentists have offered them in the past. Most dentists are not offering what John and I are offering. They're just not. They're just not. And I'm not saying we've figured out some kind of special sauce or anything. It's just that we've been able to implement these things in a way that allows us to do some of these types of cases. And, um, yep. but and, I think that, I think that, that some of the take homes from, from, from tonight, you know, from this show are, you know, it's a, it's a question that we would say you might not even know what you're missing mm-hmm. if you are not in this mindset. And I think that I did not know for sure what I was missing with this because I didn't even have the skill set to be able to think through some of these more comprehensive concepts. So as Wes said at the very beginning, let's assume, as he said, you've got some training to know. You can't just start talking about this stuff and then have these models sit on your desk (laughs) that you just look at and go, okay, well, I got the patient (laughs) say they're going to do something. So now what do I do? And I was, wait a minute, I got to give a shout out to Jeff Roush. And he said recently in advanced treatment planning, which is like the uh, echelon course that John and I've taken in the last nine months and at Spear. And Jeff said, you know, if you're, if you're still telling people they need study models to try to figure out the case, he was like, I don't think I remember a time where study models told me more of what I actually already knew when I'm actually doing the examination. And so like, right. it's not about study models. It's not about diagn. Yep. It's not about that type of diagn. Oh, I got to do a wax up to figure this out. No, right. you don't. No, you don't. Right. So, so what we're saying here That's is, you got to go down the road, and you got to learn how to think about these types of things. And 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 again, please don't take us wrong. If you're doing excellent single tooth quadrant dentistry, amazing, great. But I guarantee you that your schedule is a lot crazier than mine. Yeah. I guarantee you that you're seeing a lot more emergencies and I guarantee you that the conversations you're having with these repeat offenders, if you will, who keep breaking stuff, that mesial and sizal composite a nine just won't stay. And you've put it in there seven times. You've used every bonding material you got just keeps chipping off or, you know, people that just every single time you do uh, any root canal, they fracture the root, you know, whatever it might be. These are situations where, you can create your own hell. You can create your own hell. And and so what Wes and I are trying to say is, this is how we went about it. We didn't just go about it and just start talking to people about stuff we didn't know what 
what to pull off or how to pull off. We knew that we could, and I'm not even talking about doing full mouth dentistry at all. No. I'm just talking about the difference in what happens when you sit down, you connect with the patient, yeah. you start to establish that you're different and you're different because you're going to help them think about what's going on. It may actually end up that you do less dentistry in the end. It yeah. might end up being that you do much less dentistry in the end and much less expensive dentistry for a lot of these people through more conservative approaches yeah. if you just get them thinking about more of just a reactive mindset, just more of just, uh, like Wes said, driving their own care because they really don't know any other way to do it. And trust me, if you can start changing that, you're going to start to see that when patients come in, it's a different conversation. It's less about why is this happening? Mm -hmm. It's more about how, what just, what are we going to do about this? Are we going to take the approach of just react to it? Or is there, are we going to take the approach of there is a better way? And trust me, when those patients choose not to do it the better way, even though you've presented that there is a better way, all of a sudden, when they call you at Friday at 4 p.m., I'm not saying you won't see them. I'm not saying you don't care, but it's a very different conversation. When you just saw them a month ago in hygiene, you went, you know what, Joe? There's some things happening here that keep causing these teeth to break. I'd love to sit down and talk with you about it because I think we could prevent this number 14 from breaking if we could do this than this. And Joe goes, no. It's fine. If it breaks, I'll just call you. Mm -hmm. And then they call you for Friday at 4 p.m. You know, I don't feel bad about that. I sleep real good. I sleep great. Not that I'm not going to help them out, but I'm not feeling like, oh, no, what am I going to do here? How am I going to? He's going to come in upset or he's going to come in. No, he's going to come in and he's going to say, well, I guess this is the one we talked about, isn't it? And I guess this is the thing we talked about, isn't it? And maybe this is the time when it's it's he's ready to hear it. I think that the most, again, the most satisfying thing and I, the, is, is knowing that you can present care in a way that is caring. And what you're offering is a better way. Of caring. I'm not saying single tooth dentistry doesn't have its place. That's not what we're saying here. But what we're saying here is that there, people should have the opportunity to know that there's a better way. They may not choose that way, but what will happen in your practice as you become more astute to being able to talk about these things that you'll begin to build a patient pool of people that want the better way. It's a long game. John and I have worked very hard at this. We, we can tell you at points in our practice where even, to, even, even now there are days where we fall back into the old ways of doing things because we do get tired. And there are things, there's a lot of pressures and external pressures, and you're like, wait a minute, remind me of who we are. And that's mm -hmm. why you have to continue to recenter and remind yourself of who you are and the type of place that you're going. So, hey, this is the beginning of this type of conversation. The new patient exam, if you haven't listened to uh, the last episode, episode 168, you might want to go back and listen to that. And it talks a little bit more about um, the new patient exam and how patients enter our practice. This is talking more about how we're introducing ourselves to our patient, how we're being unique in our practice. And I think it's important that it starts with a connection. It starts mm -hmm. with understanding who people are, why they're there, what they want, and then from there, giving the opportunity for people to choose something maybe different than what they came in for. John? Yep. It's been a great yep. episode. It has. It has. If you have liked what you've heard today, if it started to get you thinking differently, 
if it's maybe challenging some of the things that you've considered, or maybe if you're already doing it in your practice, and this is just confirmation, please give us that feedback. Like, share, subscribe. Give us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. That helps us a ton. Tell your friends about us, your colleagues about us. We're going to continue to bring great content like this to you because that is what we do. So for Wes, I'm John, and we are the Dental Guys.